Hi, I want to welcome you to The Vine. I'm Jonathan, and I'm the pastor at St. Andrew, and I hope that you're blessed by our time together this week. In just a few moments, we'll have our weekly musical selection, and I'll be preaching from John chapter 10. But first, I just want to encourage you uh, to take the opportunity to uh, reach out to me, whether it's by email at jonathan.wv umc at gmail.com or to message me through our church's Facebook page just to get to know each other a little bit better. If I haven't had the privilege of getting to know you, I hope that you'll do that, whether you live near or far. I also want to encourage you to go to our church's website where you'll find different ways to grow in your faith, different ways to serve. And there's also an opportunity for you to partner with us there by financially supporting the ministries of our church. And each and every time that you give, you help us in our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Before we move on, I'd like to take just one moment to go to God in prayer. Loving God, thank you for this time together. I thank you for each person who's watching today, and I pray that you would strengthen them and encourage them on their discipleship journey. For those who are hungry, fill them. For those who are, are seeking, help them to be able to find. And I pray, God, for those who are hurting, that you will bring healing and hope into their lives. In these moments, we pray that you would speak to us through the music, through the message, and that you would lead us and guide us by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit throughout the remainder of this week. And it's in Christ's name that we pray all these things. Amen.
Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes out ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm thankful for this week's lectionary text because it stops at verse 10. And typically, when we read John chapter 10, we focus on the verses that follow where Jesus calls himself the Good Shepherd. And obviously, it's a great thing to acknowledge that Jesus is our Good Shepherd, but sometimes it eclipses what he says in verse 9. I am the gate. Now, in Jesus' time period, a sheep pen consisted of four walls... They were stone walls with an opening on the side. And the shepherd would lie down over the opening, allowing the sheep to go in and out, but would also protect the flock from bandits and prey. Therefore, the shepherd was the gate. And so being the gate and the shepherd aren't mutually exclusive. In fact, they are one and the same. But referring to himself specifically as the gate, Jesus is zeroing in on a specific function of the shepherd. The gate gives the sheep safety, but it also gives them freedom and abundant life. Now, if we read the context, the implied bandits and thieves and wolves are the religious leaders of Jesus' day. More specifically, the Pharisees that we read about in the previous chapter. And the irony is that when we read the Old Testament prophets, the religious leaders of Israel were called to shepherd God's people. They were called to be shepherds. But instead, when Jesus arrives on the scene, they're exploiting God's people for their own benefit. In other words, they needed the sheep more than the sheep needed them. Not only did the sheep not need them, but the Pharisees were ultimately doing harm to vulnerable people. While Jesus, on the other hand, not only gives them safety from the bandits and wolves, but he also gives them freedom an abundant life. More and more frequently I hear the saying, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Perhaps you've heard this saying too. It's actually the mantra of the fastest growing religious demographic in the United States. They're known as religious nuns. Not like the Roman Catholic nuns who take a vow of chastity and a vow of poverty and live in a convent, religious nuns, N-O-N-E-S, are those who uh, don't identify with any particular religion, but at the same time, they don't want to identify as atheistic. Now, I heard this term for the first time maybe about 10 years ago, and at that time, religious institutions denominational resources and seminaries began to sound the alarm 
And at first I shared in the grief and the concern and the sense of urgency. But over the last few years, my concern has shifted. I'm not so worried about the spiritual, but not religious. Now I'm more concerned with the religious, but not spiritual. Now, I don't know anyone who's explicitly identified or claimed to be religious, but not spiritual. And in some ways it might seem like I'm passing judgment. But to be fair, the Bible describes this category over and over again, and it is a pretty major concern for God. And I think that Jesus' portrayal of the Pharisees as thieves, wolves, and bandits is a pretty good place to start when we want to reflect on what it looks like to be religious but not spiritual. If we look in the previous chapter, the Pharisees refuse to celebrate when Jesus heals a man who has been blind from birth. They refuse to celebrate because uh, this miracle takes place on the Sabbath, and according to their interpretation of Scripture, Jesus has violated a holy day. Their narrow understanding of God doesn't allow things to happen outside of their control. And not only do they refuse to celebrate that this man who's been blind from birth can see for the very first time, they end up excluding him from the religious community. And all of this backstory is necessary to understand Jesus' analogy in the following chapter. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the gate. It's his goal not to control or coerce or exploit. He's the good shepherd because he gives safety, freedom, and life to the sheep. When their safety, freedom, and life are threatened by the religious institution. No wonder no one would ever claim to be religious and not spiritual. It's a, a pretty harsh indictment. And no wonder so many would claim to be spiritual but not religious. In light of all the harm that can be done by religious institutions. If anything, John chapter 10 reminds us that what we're facing right now in the religious climate of America is nothing new. But here's my experience. We tend to put the blame on the religious nuns, those who claim to be spiritual but not religious, and we make assumptions about all the reasons that they don't want to be a part of organized religion. Usually it targets their morals, their values, and their priorities. And from my experience, our solution tends to be big budget programming that fills up people's calendar with activities. We end up trying to compete with other churches and other community activities, and we become discouraged and defeated when it ultimately doesn't work. It's a vicious cycle. And if you've never heard, the definition of insanity is when we do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And I think that's a, probably a pretty accurate description of church culture in America over the last 30 years. So we've been doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And yet at the same time, I don't know a single person who isn't looking for safety, freedom, and abundant life. Which leads me to believe that their feelings and inclinations have nothing to do with Jesus and everything to do with their perception of the institution. At the end of the day, we need to stop and ask, are we offering the world 
the safety and abundant life that they're longing for? Or do we need them more than they need us? Do we need them more than they need what we are currently offering? There's a really popular song. It's a hit song on the radio by Taylor Swift called Anti-Hero. And the words to the chorus um, spoke to me this week. As I was reading this passage of scripture and the beginning of the chorus goes, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem. It's me. It sounds like a pop song, right? It's catchy. Now in the original context of the song, it's a candid confession of a young woman that she has self destructive tendencies. It's kind of refreshing to hear her taking responsibility for her own actions, that she's the number one problem in her own life. And maybe it's a bit too harsh to apply these words to ourselves or to the religious institution as a whole, but here is my thought process. If we tend to see the lack of religious engagement in America as a societal problem, then we can never really be a part of the solution. We can only be a part of blaming others. In fact, when we place the blame on others, we're, we implicitly believe that we're the solution and that people just need to get their act together and come to church. But if we're willing to accept some of the responsibility, if we're willing to say, it's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me, and we're willing to do whatever it takes, if we're willing to make whatever changes are necessary to make people feel safe, and give them access to the abundant life that's in Jesus Christ, when we're willing to do exactly what they're longing for, then we're allowing Jesus to be the solution, not us. Now, I want to be clear that I believe that St. Andrew is a wonderful church filled with all kinds of people who authentically love Jesus Christ, but the problem is that the people in our community are never going to know that until we're willing to meet them where they are. Otherwise, we'll just get painted with the same brush as the thieves, the bandits, and the wolves. Because you see, it's not their job to come to us. It's our job to go to them and offer them the safety and abundant life that's in Jesus Christ in whatever ways we possibly can. You see, when we insist that they come to us, when we insist that they meet us on our terms, then what we're really saying is that we need them more than they need us. When we're not willing to sacrifice our preferences and do whatever it takes to meet people where they are, then we need to be honest with ourselves and with God and say, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem, it's me. I think the fact that people are identifying as spiritual but not religious is a really good thing. It, it means that people are searching, that they're hungry, that they're longing for the abundant life that is available in Jesus Christ. And we have this opportunity to reach out to them with the good news. But we've got to go to them. There's this growing phenomenon called fresh expressions. Fresh expressions are a new way of doing church. And these gatherings take place in health clubs, in uh, restaurants, in public parks, and other places out in the community. And this isn't in addition to 
Sunday morning worship. This is their church. And so we might ask, why are people who struggle with institutional religion more inclined to do church this way? And obviously I'm speculating. I haven't read any research. So I can't say for certain, but I would imagine that it's the same reason that we saw people come to church at the drive-in worship services during the pandemic who had not been to church in decades. They weren't willing to come inside of a sanctuary. And it's probably the same reason that we see people engage with us at the table and compassion camp when we meet at Roadside Park. When we're meeting them where they are. That's what Jesus does. So maybe it's in those moments that we're, they're seeing Jesus in us. And we're allowing Jesus to be the solution rather than us. It's an opportunity for us to pray prayerfully consider what God is calling us to do and what we need to do to go out and offer others the abundant life that's in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Loving God, I thank you for your people. I pray that you would encourage us and equip us to go out and build relationships and do whatever it takes to offer others the abundant life that we have received in you. And it's in your name that we pray these things. Amen. I hope that you've been blessed by our time together this week, and I hope to see you again next time. Take care, and God bless.